And now in the name of our loving, liberating and life-giving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, good morning, Central Florida. <laughs> Rumor has it that you are 50 years old and you don't look a day over 20. <laughs> it is a real joy. It has been an extraordinary and exquisite joy and privilege to be able to celebrate with you, um, to give God thanks for you, and to pray God's prevenient and anticipatory grace and Holy Spirit ahead of you for the days that are ahead to bear witness to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I bring you the greetings not just of Michael Curry, but I bring you the greetings of the entire Episcopal Church. We rejoice with you, we shout glory, hallelujah with you, and we pray that the next 50 will be even better than the last. Happy birthday, Central Florida. <laughs> Happy birthday. Yeah, it's your birthday. I must say as well that, that your diocesan staff and the staff of this cathedral um, have just been extraordinary. And I thank you for just incredible hospitality and, and just thank you so much. Um, even to the point of when the cold I had turned into laryngitis yesterday and I could barely talk and I'm a little raspy now, uh, to have one of your canons go with us to the urgent care or the health care. And he sat there the whole time. The bishop led us there in grand procession. All we needed was a cross. <laughs> and I am so thankful for that and thankful for your bishop. You may not get to hear this from others because other people don't come in and talk about your bishop. Well, maybe they do, I don't know, but not normally. But I have to say as, as his colleague, as a brother for these many years, um, your bishop is respected in the councils of the church. And when he speaks, when he does speak, and we have a number of bishops who speak a lot, <laughs> but Bishop Greg Brewer doesn't go to the microphone a lot. But when he does, well, it's like, remember that old commercial, E.F. Hutton? When E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. When Bishop Greg Brewer speaks, your bishops and the church listen. And for that leadership, for his faithful and courageous voice, for his gentle and good spirit, I come to say on behalf of the House of Bishops, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. And to you, I'm just so glad you're here this morning. So thank you for coming. It's just good to be here, and it really is a wonderful and a joyous day. Well, allow me, if you will, to, again, please forgive my voice, but allow me, if you will, to offer a text from the Acts of the Apostles in the New Testament. You'll remember in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when I used to do vacation Bible school with kids, used to teach them the song, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John heard good news and passed it on. Right? Well, when they passed it on, you get to the Acts of the Apostles. That's when it gets passed on and passed on to the whole world. And in the Acts of the Apostles, it begins with Jesus after the crucifixion, after he has been raised from the dead, and soon before he's about to ascend into heaven, returning to the fullness of the Godhead, just before the ascension, if you will, he says this. So when they had come together, they asked Jesus, Lord, is it time, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but this much you will know. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit is come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. It is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has set by his own authority, but this much you will know, and this is actually all you need to know. You 
will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, first century Palestine, 21st century Orlando. You will be my witnesses, my witnesses. Oh, old slaves used to sing a spiritual said, can I get a witness for my Lord? <laughs> oh, we need some witnesses, some witnesses. Now, the truth is, this witness thing is all over the Bible. It really is. It's, it's, it's there in the Hebrew Scriptures in the Old Testament. Um, I mean, it's, it's not just in the New Testament. In Isaiah chapter 43, verse 10, um, the Lord says to the prophet, you are my witness, and says to all of Israel, you will be my witness. You are to be a light to the nations. It's all over the Bible. It's in the Psalms. You will be my witness. It's later found in the New Testament, in the Gospel of John, for example, where it says there was a man, y'all remember this? There was a man sent from God whose name was, do y'all remember that one? Remember his name? John. That, that was Greg Brewer's performance evaluation. I was testing him. <laughs> <laughs> you just passed, brother. <laughs> there was a man sent from God whose name was John, and it says he came to bear witness, not to himself. But he came to bear witness to the light. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness to the light. John chapter 1. And then at the end of Luke's gospel, um, Jesus, after he's been raised from the dead, says to the disciples, he says, look, all of this has been written uh, that the Messiah must suffer and, and die and only then be raised from the dead in order that repentance and forgiveness of sins might be proclaimed to the whole universe. And then he says, and you are witnesses of these things. I'm telling you, it's in the Bible. I'm not making this up. <laughs> and then we get to, to the first chapter um, of the Acts of the Apostles when they have to replace Judas, because you remember he kind of had some issues. <laughs> and so they had to replace Judas, and, and there were two basic criteria. It had to be somebody who had been with them, had actually experienced Jesus, heard what he taught, saw the manner of his life, experienced his living, vibrant, his real, the presence of God through this guy, somebody who had walked with them, but also someone who was a witness to the resurrection. There it is. But then you get to our text. They said, Lord, at this time, Will you restore to us the kingdom of Israel? And Jesus says, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed. Now, what I think is really going on in that conversation, what they were asking, because see, they had been through the crucifixion. They had been, they had seen him alive from the dead. Let me tell you all something. I really do believe Jesus was raised from the dead. And I don't mean that just metaphorically. The brother was down for the count, and he got up on Sunday morning. <laughs> right? Hey, if I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be here. I'd be on Hollywood making some money right now. <laughs> no, no. I mean, they had experienced something incredible, something unbelievable. He was alive so that they said, Jesus, we, you, you know, you were dead. We saw what happened to you. In fact, we ran away. We saw it. Um, and, and now you're alive. We know you've been raised from the dead. Surely this must be the inbreaking of the kingdom. Surely now God's will is going to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Surely now poverty will become history. Surely now we will beat our swords into plowshares and study war no more. Now God's reign. Now God's kingdom. Now. And Jesus says, now don't get too excited. It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has set, which is another way of saying all that you just said, that is not your business. Or better yet, to put it in the King James vernacular, it ain't y'all's business. <laughs> <coughs> your business is not to worry about the times or the seasons, how God's going to bring in God's kingdom. That's God's business. Your job is to be my witnesses. My witnesses in Jerusalem, my witnesses in Judea, my witnesses in Samaria, my witnesses unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Oh, it's all over the Bible. Can I get a witness this morning? Oh, we need some witnesses, Central Florida. Now, I, I know what I'm about to say, and, and let me just come on down. 
Um, I, I know that, well, I've been an Episcopalian my whole life. And I don't know nuclear physics, but I know Episcopalians. And I know there's somebody here right now saying, you know, preacher, this all sounds very good about witnesses. But uh, first of all, is this really Episcopalian? All right, all right, y'all with me now? <laughs> See, I knew that you were thinking it, um, <laughs> and 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 I and I and I appreciate that 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 thought because I know for a fact that there is an unusual there is an unusual number of lawyers in the Episcopal Church, <laughs> and they parse every word and scrupulize every statement. And somebody is saying, you know, it may be true that, that that's in the Bible, but, well, you know, we're Episcopalians. And it may be in the Bible, but if it's not in the prayer book, we don't have to believe it. <laughs> and I get an amen from somebody? <laughs> so, Bishop Brewer, I went back to the prayer book, and I looked to see if maybe I was off base. And lo and behold, I turned to page 517, in the ordinal, the service of the ordination of a bishop, and this is what it says in one of the vows, a bishop in God's holy, this is in the prayer book now, a bishop in God's holy church is called to be one with the apostles in proclaiming Christ's resurrection and interpreting the God, this is some good stuff, proclaiming Christ's resurrection, interpreting the gospel, and to testify. Oh my goodness, my grandma knew what testifying meant. Oh, give me, I got six more years as presiding bishop. Before I finish, that house of bishops is going to be testifying. They're going to be witnessing, testify to Christ's sovereignty as King of kings and Lord of lords. That's witnessing. But if we need to get even more specific, how about this one? Page 855, the catechism, the teaching office of the church. It says the ministry of lay, per well, let me find, are there any lay people here? Let me see hands of lay people. Okay, we got lay people, we got lay people here. Clergy, we're all still lay people too, actually, but everybody's baptized. Okay, that's everybody in the room. Um, the ministry of lay people is to represent Christ and his church and to bear witness to him wherever they may be. Oh, can I get a witness this morning? But if you keep working it even more, you get to the post-communion prayer on page 366, and it prays before you go out into the world, and now, Father, send them out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful, Witnesses. faithful, Witnesses. faithful. Witnesses. This is in the prayer book. <laughs> and, and maybe the most important passage is actually in holy baptism. And, and the reason we do baptism and confirmation, because see, we know in baptism you promise to follow Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, um, and you made all those promises, and we don't know how old you were when, that, when you made those promises or when your godparents made them. Um, but well, however it was, we know that human beings have a tendency to forget. And so we send a bishop around every couple of years just to remind you of what you promised to do in baptism. And at the service of holy baptism and confirmation, we pray for the candidates, and one of the prayers says, Father, send them out as witnesses to your love. Oh, my brothers and sisters, I believe the loophole some of the legal scholars in the room thought was there. I think we have sufficiently closed that loophole. This is not just biblical. This is Anglican. This is Episcopalian. I sit down and I rest my case. We need some witnesses. But the truth is, I know there's a little, um, what, awkwardness about witnesses, I know. Because if you're like me, you hear that word witness, well, I think of a Saturday afternoon. I'm back home in Raleigh, North Carolina, and it's April or May, and it's a Saturday morning, excuse me. I've gotten up and I've put my bacon on. I don't, my 
wife eats that vegetarian bacon. I don't, I don't touch that. Uh, I put my coffee on and my, my bacon and, you know, get the newspaper or pick up the iPad and sit, my, sit down in the living room and sip some coffee and eat a little bacon and toast. Then kind of look out the front window and I can kind of see, you know how it's hazy about 7 o'clock in the morning on Saturday? But the sun is coming up, and somebody's cutting their lawn, and you can smell that smell of green grass. Can you smell it? And green grass and the smell of coffee and the smell of bacon. <laughs> Lord, this is almost as good as incense. It's just, bro, <laughs> I mean, it is just, just overwhelming. And, and, and you kind of look out, and you can kind of hear the sound of some children playing out in the neighborhood. And then I look down the street, and I, and I see some people coming into the neighborhood. It looks like there are two of them. <laughs> they got a little bag in their hand. <laughs> they got little magazines in that bag. And it looks like they're coming to our house. And so I get up from the couch, <laughs> and I go over, <laughs> and I pull the curtains closed <laughs> and try to hide and hope they go to somebody else's house. <laughs> when I hear that word witness, that's what I hear, and that's what I think of, and I say, oh, Lord, don't tell me that's what we got to do, too. But the truth is, we do need some witnesses, maybe not exactly in that way, maybe in that way for some, but, but we need some witnesses to, to the way of faith, the way of Jesus that we know in this church. We need some witnesses. Are y'all with me on this? We need some, oh, they told me I can't come down this far. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> we need some witnesses to a way of being Christian that actually resembles Jesus of Nazareth, that actually looks something like Jesus, and that actually is about love. That prayer book is right. We need some witnesses to the love of God that we have known in Jesus Christ. Because witnesses to that good news, witnesses to that word, witnesses to this way of Jesus, which is the way of love. Remember that old hymn, the king of love my shepherd is, whose goodness faileth never. I nothing lack if I am his and he is mine forever. Oh, my brothers and sisters, we need some witnesses to that way of love, some witnesses to Jesus. And I say what I'm about to say, not in judgment of anybody. I remember some years ago when I was Bishop of North Carolina. This is good 10, 15 years ago. And members of the staff, Bishop said, you need to get on Facebook. And I said, I don't need one more thing to do. But I finally gave in. And so we sat down in the office and filled out the information. You know, you put your name and sort of where you live and where you went to high school and, and on and on and on. And we got to religious affiliation. And so I just instinctively started to type, you know, Christian. And then I said, well, wait a minute. Don't worry. I know I'm, I'm a Christian. Don't worry. I'm, I'm serious about that. But I wasn't sure if everybody was going to mean Christian like I mean Christian. But I got a little nervous about what does, that, what does that word mean when it spins out there? D does it mean being a follower of Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Does it mean for everybody who sees that word to be a Christian is to be one who follows in the footsteps of Jesus? Somebody who dares to try to love like Jesus, to give like Jesus, to forgive like Jesus, to do justice like Jesus, to love mercy, to walk humbly with God just like Jesus. And I wasn't sure, so I just put Christian slash Episcopalian. I figured nobody would know what that meant. <laughs> but I am convinced that we need Christians who will stand up for Jesus, stand up for his love, stand up for his goodness, stand up for his way, because I am convinced Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. I may not be his best disciple, but I, doggone it, I sure want to be one. Because I really do believe that this Jesus has shown us the way to live. That his way of love really is the way of life. 
not just for some, but for all. It's the way to reunite our nation again. It's a way to unite our world, our church, our homes. And if you don't believe me, oh, we need some witnesses to that kind of love. Are y'all with me so far? Um, it, it, the truth is, if you don't believe me, ask St. Paul. Now, St. Paul was no flaming liberal, <laughs> right? And if you open your Bible to 1 Corinthians, that's 1 Corinthians, and go to 1 Corinthians 13, you'll see that passage that 99% of the brides I have ever married have selected for their passage at their wedding. Now, I mean, I'm telling you, am I wrong, Bishop? I mean, almost every time, it is the default, it's the wedding passage. And that's a good, that's fine, that's wonderful. Um, I love it when you had the, the bride, uh, the potential bride there and, and the groom. The groom is like clueless, but anyway, the bride. <laughs> But never fail. So yeah, get 1 Corinthians 13. And I have to admit, I always associated um, with weddings. And the truth is, St. Paul wasn't thinking about a wedding when he wrote it. It applies. It does apply. But he wasn't thinking about a wedding. You know what he was thinking about? A church fight. Oh, help. Somebody, somebody say amen. I, I, oh, yeah. He was talking about a church fight. In the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, St. Paul says... He wasn't in Corinth at the time that he wrote the letter. He says, it has been reported to me by Chloe's people. I stepped and thought, who's Chloe? And then after being a pastor all these years, I said, oh, I know Chloe. <laughs> There's a Chloe in every church. <laughs> Chloe knows everybody's business. We ought to have guilds named after the Chloe Guild. <laughs> Oh yeah, Chloe is in everybody's business, knows everybody's business, and, and, and is an evangelist of everybody's business, wanting to share the news with everybody. And so Paul says, it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that you are dividing yourselves into factions. He says it. Oh, some of you say, oh, I was baptized by Cephas. Some of you say, oh, I was baptized by Apollos. Oh, some of you say, oh, I'm baptized in the name of Jesus. Some of you say, I was baptized by Paul. Paul said, did, did Paul die for you? Did Cephas save you? What about Jesus? Oh, my brother said, this is a church. I got to tell you, this was a church. This church was a mess. Um, the, the Corinthian church was kind of a, a ming, mingle of a scandal and um, um, all my children. Uh, <laughs> you know, Guide and Light and all those shows and your general hospital. I mean... I mean, this Corinthian, this church was a mess. If you read in 1 Corinthians what was going on, there was somebody was sleeping with somebody else's wife in the church. In the church! I'm not making this up. This is in the Bible. 1 Corinthians, not only that, somebody else was suing somebody else in the church, because who knows why, but they were suing somebody else in the church. All this in this one church. And then the rich folk were getting their communion before the poor folk. They were getting in line before theirs. Some people were enjoying communion so much, they were getting drunk at church. <laughs> this is a messed up church. You think you need some congregational development work in Central Florida? You got nothing on the Corinthian church. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Then on top of it, some folks said, I got the spirit because I speak in tongues, and you don't because you don't speak in tongues. Some folks said, I'm going to be raised from the dead, and you're not going to be, and you're going to be left behind. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And finally, Paul says, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am a noisy gong, a clanging cymbal. Love is not jealous. Love is not rude. Love seeks the good. Love seeks the truth. Love believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. We need some witnesses to the way of Jesus, which is the way of love. We need some witnesses to that kind of Christian today in our time.
and in our world. And the truth is, some people may never see it if they don't see it in us, if they don't see it in us. This I'm going to sit down. I, many years ago, I was a young priest. I was thin. I didn't have any gray hair. I was cute. <laughs> many years ago. <laughs> so I was a new deacon, newly ordained, just out of seminary. I think 24 years old. We were talking about that the other day, Bishop Brewer. 24 years old. I was a kid. And, and the bishop in North Carolina assigned me to St. Stephen's Church in, in Winston-Salem to be the deacon in charge. And so um, I went, and it was my new assignment, and I had never had my own office. And I remember thinking, oh, this is just like, wow, I got my own office and had my own typewriter. It was an IBM Selectric. You all remember those? <laughs> oh, man, I had the little ball. Remember the kind you take off? And Oh, I, I just was in heaven. And um, I remember sitting down at my brand new desk. I had never had a real desk before and with my IBM Selectric typewriter. And we had a mimeograph. We, ha we had an electric mimeograph. Remember those? Oh, it was, it was just, I mean, I was the cat's meow, a priest. Um, and more than that, at 24, as a new deacon and soon new priest, I knew everything. <laughs> I don't know why I wasn't presided bishop then, because I knew everything then. Well, I was sitting down my first day, it was Monday or Tuesday, um, when, my, when I first day in the, in the church, and I was in the office, and we had a daycare center just down the hallway in the other wing of the church. And um, there were little children, three and four-year-olds for the most part. And I remember um, one of the kids um, early on came down the hallway, and I hadn't had a chance to meet the children yet. But one of the little boys, he came down to go to the bathroom, and the two bathrooms were across from my office. Little boy came down, and he looked in my office, and he looked at me, and he said, Are you God? Now, I, you know, I was recently graduated from seminary, so I was swift with a good theologically appropriate answer. I said, no, I'm not God. I just work for him, <laughs> which actually wasn't that bad, to tell you the truth. Um, I thought that would satisfy him, and he went on back, you know, to the room. And um, a little while later, another child came down and looked in and just looked at me. I said, hello, honey. And, and the child said, are you God? I said, no, I, I just worked for him. And I was beginning to wonder, what did that little kid go back and tell those children? <laughs> and, and then later on, the teachers took the children out to the playground to play, and they had to pass my office to get to the playground. All the kids were like, coming by, hello, God, good morning, God. And the teachers were looking at me like, what is wrong with this man? What's he telling these children? <laughs> and then after that, though, I have to tell you, I've thought about it a little more. I said, you know something? Maybe those children should look at me and mistake me for God. Don't worry, I don't have any, any confusion about that. <laughs> but, but maybe they should look at me and see something of Jesus of Nazareth in me. Maybe the children should look at us, and when they look at us, they see Jesus. They see the love of Jesus. They see the compassion of Jesus. They see the goodness of Jesus. They see the spirit that is in Jesus. Maybe when the world looks at us, they see something of Jesus Christ, and through us, they see God. Oh, I have a dream for this Episcopal church that one day, one day people will not only be able to spell the word Episcopal, But one day when they look at us, they see the love of God revealed in Jesus Christ. That's my prayer. That's my prayer. That's my prayer. Central Florida, may the love of God that we know in Jesus breathe through you. Be your witness. Be our witness to this world until we become, by God's amazing grace, a healing balm in Gilead. Because as the old slaves used to say, if you cannot preach like Peter and you cannot pray like Paul, you just tell the love of Jesus 
how he died to save us all. There is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin sick soul. God love you. God bless you. And may God hold us all with those almighty hands of love.